This is Florida Gulf Coast University. I always read the first, I'm new to the prose thing, so I always read the first chapter of the book because I don't really know how to set up a story. Um, so but then I realized the second chapter, like not much has actually happened yet, so maybe I can actually read the second chapter because children's book chapters are like five pages long. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna read chapter two and all you need to know is that our parents just had a really big fight. This is about a little girl named Rebecca. On Halloween, for the first time ever, Dad and I stayed home with the bowl of candy on the porch, eating all the peanut butter cups ourselves. This is for like a, a nine to 12 year old person. <clears throat> While mom took Lou trick or treating. Lou dressed up as a last minute ghost, even though he'd asked to be a pirate. I watched him walk down the street, a little blob of white holding mom's hand in a plastic orange pumpkin. It felt weird, lonely, watching the two of them walk off down the hill without us. But for the most part, I couldn't see that anything had really changed after the fight, except that Dad slept on the couch. Mom had asked him to go and stay somewhere else for a while, but he said it was his house too, and he wasn't going to be put out of it, damn it. What I hated most was having to say goodnight twice. First to Dad on the couch in the dark with the TV turned down low, then to Mom in her bed with a book in her hand. During the day, there was a big pile of blankets that stayed on the couch, and that was pretty fun. When I came home from school in the afternoons, Mary-Kate and I would make a big nest out of the blankets and watch TV and eat ramen with extra soy sauce. We'd practice using chopsticks, and we'd spill and eat and watch shows we weren't supposed to watch. I hoped that when Mom decided to stop being mad and she and Dad worked it out, we could keep the pile of blankets. I was beginning to think that everything was about to blow over, and then one cold Wednesday morning, I came downstairs for breakfast and found that Mom had all our mismatched suitcases laid out on the floor in the living room. Where are you going? I asked. We are going on a trip, she said. What about school? I said, it's Wednesday. You can miss some school this once, she said, pulling an old sock from the bottom of a backpack. I wondered how long the sock had been there. We didn't take trips very often, almost never. Okay, I guess, I said, only where are we going? Home, she answered softly. We're going home. Oh. I knew that by home, she meant Atlanta, Georgia, and Grand. That was the only place besides Baltimore she could possibly mean when she said home. It was where Mom was from, where she'd grown up. Gran usually flew to see us for Christmas, although Dad made a point of calling those visits Hanukkah vacation. He wasn't very Jewish, but Christmas always made him grumpy. We hadn't been to Atlanta to see Gran in years. Mom was always saying we'd go next year, but when next year came, she never seemed to have the time off for a vacation. I tried to remember Gran's house, but all I could picture was a lot of dark wood trim, purple curtains, and a yard full of flowers. Dad, too, I asked, even though I was pretty sure I knew the answer. Mom didn't say anything. When will we come back, I asked after a minute. She fidgeted with a broken zipper on a green duffel bag. When it makes sense to. I went to get some breakfast, like any other day. Lou is at the table putting dried Cheerios into a spoon with his fingers. He usually eats like that. Fills his fork or a spoon with his fingers, then drops a lot on the floor so it takes a while. When he has the spoon full, he puts it in his mouth. I could see Dad through the cutout window separating the eating part of the kitchen from the cooking part. The window is there because once upon a time, before we lived there, the cooking part of the room was the back porch. Now we don't have a back porch, just three steps that drop down into our skinny little backyard. Dad was standing at the sink with a coffee filter over one hand, staring off into space. He was like a statue of a guy making coffee, except that his hands were shaking. His mouth was a thin, straight line, tight, like someone had sewn it shut. Hi, Dad, I said, walking around to him and taking a banana from the bowl beside him on the counter. It didn't feel like the right thing to say, but I couldn't think of anything else. Hi, Bex. His voice sounded like he had a sore throat. I went back to the table and sat down next to Lou. Dad didn't follow me. He just stood beside the sink looking at me and Lou. Then he stared past us at Mom and the suitcases two rooms away. I willed him to say something else, to stop what was happening. I tried to send him a psychic message. I peeled my banana very carefully and ate it as slowly as I could to give him a chance to step in and fix things. He didn't get the message. I don't know what happened after I went to the bus stop, but when I got home from school that day, the car was packed. I didn't get to pick out my own stuff. I didn't get to say goodbye to Mary Kate. Mom was waiting on the porch with Lou. Dad was standing down in the street by our old green car, looking like he might throw up. His hand was on the roof of the car. I went over and stood beside him. Mom started down the stairs, dragging Lou along with her. When she got to the sidewalk, she let go of his hand and took out the keys. She seemed to be in a really big hurry. Annie, don't, Dad said to her. He scraped a fingernail across the flaking paint on top of the car. 
Then he put his hands in his pockets. Please don't. I thought maybe he would try grabbing her, hugging her, or kneeling or something, like in a movie. He didn't. Mom lifted Lou into his car seat in the back. She snapped him in and shut the door. Get in, Rebecca, she said, opening her own door and motioning to the passenger seat beside her. She slid in and stuck the key into the ignition. I stood there on the sidewalk, looking back and forth from my mom in the car to my dad beside me on the pavement. I remember it was really windy, cold for fall. The sky was pale gray, almost white like it is sometimes over the harbor. A gull screamed. Say goodbye, Rebecca, said my mom. But it's time to go, she snapped. Then she closed her eyes and took a deep breath. She let it out. Don't worry, you'll see your father again. This isn't the end of the world. She was wrong. It was the end of the world. Everything felt wrong, lopsided. Lou smiled and waved, bye, Daddy. He thought we were running errands or something, going to the Safeway, maybe. My dad opened his mouth, but no words came out. His hands were in his jean pockets. His shoulders were hunched, but he still wasn't doing or saying anything. I looked at him, and I looked at him, and he looked different than he'd ever looked to me before. Thinner. He wasn't wearing a coat. I memorized him. My heart felt cold in my chest, but I didn't know what to say. Last, I kind of fell into him. I rubbed my face against his soft flannel shirt. A button scraped my cheek. And then he took his hands out of his pockets and bent over me to hug me. I put my arms around his chest. He didn't make a sound, and there weren't tears, but his body was shaking all around me like a silent movie of someone crying. Or maybe he was just shivering in the wind. He smelled a little like cigarette smoke and a lot like sweat. My dad. My dad was so strong, he never cried. I don't know, he whispered to me, answering a question I hadn't asked. I felt frozen, stuck to him, stuck with him in a bubble, in that hug so tight it was bruising my arms. We were going to leave my dad, and there was nothing I could do. It wasn't possible. It was too fast. I just hugged and hugged and hugged. But then, then my mother behind me said in a tiny voice, Rebecca, please, don't make this any harder for me. And I listened. I didn't have to listen. I shouldn't have, but I did. I turned my head from my dad and unhugged him. I pulled away from his arms, wiggled out, opened the car door, and ducked inside. I looked at my lap. I didn't look at him. If he wasn't going to cry, then I wasn't going to cry either. I could be strong, too. Dad followed, leaned in after me through the open door, grabbed my chin with his cold hand, and turned my face toward him. He kissed me on the forehead. He put something in my hand, folded my fingers shut, and squeezed my fist with his own big hand. I love you, he said. So much love. Which was funny to hear out loud. He didn't say things like that very often. He reached back to touch Lou, but just then my mom turned the key, started the engine. The car made a big noise. My door was still open. Over the noise of the car, through my open door, Dad said, Annie, please, we can still, they're my kids. I'll try, don't. I already did, she said. We'll call you when we get there. That was how we left him, through an open car door. My mom stepped on the gas. The car began to move. My dad jumped back to the sidewalk, off balance. When I turned around, I could see him standing in the street. He was calling after us. My dad was yelling in the street for everyone to hear. And then he was running behind the car. He was calling, come back. I went back around to make sure mom was seeing that, to make sure she had seen dad yelling and running after us. But I guess she didn't care because she turned a corner and we were gone. The open car door scraped the ground for a full block before I finally managed to pull it shut. The sound was terrible, grinding. I put on my seatbelt. What else could I do? Thanks.